So we're getting into it today. I'm rolling up my sleeves. Uh, I told a few people earlier, uh, if I burn into, or uh, erupt into flames, please put me out as quickly as you can. I'm, I'm saying that uh, as a joke, of course, but I am bringing up some subjects. I am bringing up some subjects that may be controversial. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Children's church. Go ahead, uh, kids, you're excused. Children's church. That's one of my favorite noises, by the way, the kids rumbling out the door. Um, I think that's a sign of health in any church. And it, it was squeaking a little bit earlier. Sorry about that. So, uh, ooh. <laughs> what I was saying was that's one of my favorite sounds when the children rumble away. Um, part of it is health of a church. Uh, would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, please allow what I'm saying to be your words and not mine. Please open our hearts and minds. Please uh, help me be clear in my explanation of what's on my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. And I did need that prayer. So this is titled Duality. Which hill are you willing to die on? Truth. When we consider the truth, we view it as something that is occurring or has occurred with one correct interpretation. It can be defined as the quality or state of being true, that which is true or in accordance with or, excuse me, with fact or reality. A fact or belief that is accepted as true. We are called to seek the truth, to tell the truth, and to be guided by the truth. The word truth is mentioned in all 66 books of the Bible a total of 224 times. The word true, just a slight change, is mentioned 77 times. And synonyms for the word truth show up another handful of times. Take into consideration all of the translations, the various translations, and we can see that the truth is a major theme throughout the book. Not to mention that the Eighth Commandment states clearly, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. As we recall that God is regarded as the author of all truth. All of this to say one thing. We all view truth as an unarguable fact. There is one truth, the only one truth. However, believe it or not, two things can contradict each other and still be true. Let me say that another way. There can be multiple truths. Just because something is true does not mean that something else that opposes it or contradicts it is false. In fact, logic tells us that reasoning is conducted and assessed according to strict principles of validity. You might ask, how can two things that contradict each other be true? And that's appropriate. If you're thinking, he doesn't know what he's talking about, that's probably true. <laughs> How can two things that contradict each other still be true? So I want you to hold on to that thought for a moment. I'm going to jump into another subject and I'll come back to it, I promise. Uh, maybe even while I'm speaking on this other subject, you can ruminate on that and see what I'm trying to talk about. Two major themes in my life, science and faith. 
In the high school right now, we're teaching a program called Character Strong. Once a week, classes are separated into grade levels, and we work on such characteristics as kindness. What is kindness? And how do you exercise it? This program is built upon the premise that it is easier to, to use a skill if we practice it. We've had challenges for students to say thank you for people, to people who do something kind for them. We learn how to shake hands. We also define the eight essential components of, of character. One thing that stuck with me in our teacher training was a statement that Esteban, our trainer, told us. He said, character and intelligence together are what we're aiming for for graduates at the high school level. Character without intelligence is ineffective. Somebody could have a great big heart, be the kindest person in the world, but they might not be successful. They may not be able to function without those hard skills, reading, writing, math. And it's very possible that they won't succeed. We hope people like that will succeed. But we probably know examples of those who haven't. Intelligence without character is dangerous. There have been a lot of examples in our history of brilliant people who have done heinous crimes, awful things to other human beings. In many ways, we're living in a time of great cognitive dissonance. There is so much information at our fingertips that even the most skilled consumer of information can be duped into believing non-truths. Science and faith are often pinned against each other. Excuse me, often pinned against each other and framed as antitheses of each other. But these two concepts, faith and science, without each other, are ineffective and dangerous. Each are tools for us to discover truths, both about ourselves and about the, rule, the world around us. It is my goal today to convince you that science and faith are inescapably linked, even when they contradict each other, that truths can be equally true, even when they contradict each other, and that there are many hills worth dying on, but probably not the one you're standing on. Back to truth. So you remember, two things can be true, even when they contradict each other. We use the term paradox, also known as an antimony, to describe a statement or idea that is seemingly absurd or self-contradictory, or a proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. Example number one, the liar's paradox. The liar's paradox is probably the simplest example of a logical paradox. The statement goes like this. I am lying. If I'm lying, then I'm actually telling the truth, which means I just lied. You see, I can't be a liar and say I lied without telling the truth, which means the statement itself is indeed a lie. This is an example of a logical paradox that is used to point out flaws in our logic. Example number two, Einstein's theory of relativity. The train scenario. I, I could talk about this all day. I'll try to keep it short and sweet, though. <laughs> so here it is. Imagine you're standing on a train traveling half the speed of light. That's hard to do, I know, because we've never traveled anything close to that. There's a couple foundational things that we need to know. First, the, the speed of light is roughly 300 million meters per second, or 186,000 uh, miles per second. 
The really crazy thing is, no matter where the observer is or how fast the observer is traveling, it's still traveling at that speed to that observer. It's this weird paradox. But I'll get to uh, how, in some ways, it's very true. So you're on the train. The train is traveling at half the speed of light, passing a train station. Someone else is on the platform of the train station. That person on the platform sees two lightning strikes at the exact same time, one to the engine of the train and one to the caboose of the train. That person would say those struck simultaneously. However, you in the train traveling the direction of the engine would observe that the light struck the engine first and the caboose second. These two things, both true to each observer, could be arguably contradictory to each other. Since you're traveling a portion of the speed of light, the light that it takes, or the time it takes for the light from the engine to reach you is shorter than the time it takes for the light from the caboose to reach you. So you would observe it two separate strikes. Uh, the theory of relativity, by the way, is full of these. And what's nuts is up until recently, all of general relativity and, and uh, special relativity were believed to be just theoretical. However, we have observed some of these things that Einstein predicted. 65 miles away at LIGO, we have observed gravitational waves that, that warp space-time, something that was believed to not ever have existed in real life, we recorded. I know there's a lot of people who perhaps question validity of science, and that's what we're getting into right now. There are many pet paradoxes that I could bring up. However, for the sake of time, I will just list a few of them. If you're interested, you can look them up yourself. One, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the paradox of hedonism, the black hole information paradox, the catch-22, and the list goes on. We can see how concepts can be contradictory and seem to be both be true. In the cases above, they seem to be on, of no consequence. So what? So what if the person on the train sees the lightning strike the engine and then the caboose, and the person on the platform sees them strike at the same time? So what? That's not of consequence. We are content with throwing our hands up. Likewise, each day we're faced with many conflicts. A phrase I've become fond of as a teacher is, that's not a hill I'm willing to die on. I thought that was a train whistle for a second. <laughs> we all have our axes to grind, and we all want to be right, but at what expense? Hill number one, old earth versus new earth. Many of you, I'm sure, know this argument. The Judeo-Christian theologians argue that the earth is roughly 6,000 years old. Many Christians believe this. The idea is that God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1, 1 through 2 states, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We likely know this verse. In fact, Bible Gateway blog ranked Genesis 1 the fifth most well-known Bible verse of the list of 100. I would argue that this verse is probably also the most well-read verse. From my experience, I've attempted to read through the Bible many times, and I, each time I've at least made it through that very first verse. <laughs> 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 so
So where do we get young earth or new earth? Where, where does that concept come from? Well, people have counted up the first days of creation through the first week, the creation of man, the day of rest, then the life of Adam and Eve and their children and their children's children. They counted up through the life of Noah and Moses and their children. And we know the age of many people in the Bible. We know that because the Bible itself tells us. In Genesis 5, it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he man. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his, son, called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. I'll save you the whole story, because you probably know it already. But they added up all of these years, and they came up with 6,000 years. It referenced the history that we have, and it's an estimate. But many theologians agree on this number. So we have this one new earth concept. We have a totally different concept from science. And science tells us the earth is 4.543 billion years old. Many of us may not know how that number came to be. But in 1965, Claire Cameron Peterson used a process he developed called uranium lead dating to test the age of meteorites. Basically, uranium has a very short half-life, which is the amount of time it takes for half the sample of uranium to decompose into lead. Uranium has a very unstable nucleus. Nuclear particles want to break apart and leave the nucleus. The half-life of uranium is 704 million years. We know this based because we can measure the rate of decay within samples of uranium. Frustratingly, the Earth is constantly changing. We couldn't just go out and pick up a piece of rock and test that and know the age of the Earth. Because of tectonic plates and weather, erosion, and life, the Earth that we stand on is not the same as the Earth at the beginning. Because of this, there are no great locations on Earth to find old rocks. So they thought maybe they'd use meteorites. Anyway, a few years after Dr. Peterson made this discovery, we landed on the moon. The moon rocks brought back were the same age as the meteorites, and many believe that Earth and the moon were created when two large astronomical bodies collided. So we have the age of the Earth from the science standpoint. This is not a hill I'm willing to die on. Is the age of the earth young or old? Yes. It is. Really, accepting that we cannot be sure is probably the most genuine answer. We have to know what the consequences are. In my profession, I would be doing my students a disservice if I didn't provide information for them. I also don't view this as controversial. Obviously, it is controversial. As a former non-believer myself, I would have to say that this 
is one concept I would use to prove my point. Not a single believer ever convinced me that they were telling me the truth because the Bible said it. I was won over through my emotions, through my heart. If our goal is to share the gospel and share our Lord, Jesus Christ, with others, I would caution using this hill to prove your point. Hill number two, evolution. <laughs> I can hear the crickets. <laughs> this topic is very difficult to talk about. This, more than the age of the earth, creates the fiercest of arguments. In fact, this kept me away from faith for a long time. It's more complicated than I think many realize. In 19, or excuse me, in 1859, when Charles Darwin first published On the Origin of Species, it quickly became known as the book that shook the world. What many don't realize, however, is that the study of evolution only started at that point. Since then, the idea of species changing over time has become the foundational concept in the field of biology. Science know, now knows tenfold what Darwin was able to only speculate on. From genetics to ecology and epidemiology to medicine, the concept is a foundation. I won't belabor the point. I'm sure you've all heard it. Of course, on the other hand, Genesis 127 tells us, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created. We can see how this conflict, this is a conflict in world views. On one hand, God created man in the form he is today, in God's likeness. Any other ex explanation may discredit God himself. This is not a hill I am willing to die on. Nor do I think it necessary for any Christian to die on this hill. In fact, Many denominations have accepted a combination of these two views and have parceled a bit of the age of the earth in there as well. The Catholic Church holds no official position on the theory of creation or evolution, leaving the specifics of either theistic evolution or literal creationism to the individual within certain parameters established by the Church according to Catholicism or the Catechism of the Catholic Church any believer may accept either literal or specific creation within the period of an actual six-day 24-hour period or they may accept the belief that the earth evolved over time under the guidance of God Catholicism holds that God initiated and continued the process of his evolutionary creation and that all humans, whether specifically created or evolved, have always had specially created souls for each individual. Neither one of these concepts I'm willing to die for. And I know probably uh, many of you are questioning how I feel. Well, I'm going to give you uh, a fence answer, meaning I'm not taking either side. Here is what I'm willing to die for. Here is the hill worth dying on. Jesus Christ has sought me, despite me, despite my opinions on the age of the earth, despite my opinions on the creation of man, Jesus has sought me despite me and has forgiven me of my sins. Romans 10, 8 through 10. 
But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised, his, raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you struggle knowing what to believe, this is your saving grace. This is our saving grace. This sermon, in many ways, was for me. I hope showing you a glimpse of what I struggle with gives you an idea of what many struggle with and perhaps gives you more resolve in your beliefs. I'm envious if you have a stronger foundation than I do. If you disagree with me or what I've said, great. You're probably right. I am only man. I know not of what I speak. Going forward, however, I do hope that there's a balance in your life and that truth will set you free. Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for what you have done. The Bible says that if we believe in our heart and speak with our mouths that you are king and that you died for our sins and came back. You are the way. That's the first time someone has prayed that prayer. I'd like to pray for you this week. If you could show your hand, no eyes looking. Raise your name. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for our ability to argue with each other, but to seek out the truth. And thank you most of all for seeking us. We don't deserve it. In Jesus' name, amen.